From humble beginnings in a San Francisco apartment to today, Salesforce is venturing into the tech of tomorrow. But will big deals and bigger rumors help it claim the crown in a consumer economy? Or will the stock fall short? Could there be a more momentous time to be in San Francisco? We came out here for Salesforce's Dreamforce conference. It's the annual pilgrimage for all things related to cloud computing. But this year's confab comes right after the company's $700 million acquisition of Crux, a marketing data startup, at the same time, same moment when rumors are swirling that Salesforce might be in the running to buy Twitter. Now, the Twitter story has been hammering the company's stock. But as I said before, I think Twitter has the potential to become a very valuable asset under a company like Salesforce, the ultimate way to figure out what the consumer's thinking and what she wants. That's not how it's run at the moment, but if you look at Twitter as a treasure trove of data rather than just a social media platform, you can see how a potential deal might make sense at the right price, right price only. Either way, though, a high-quality growth stock right now, right here, is getting slammed. And I think it's creating a buying opportunity. So earlier today, I got a chance to sit down with Mark Benioff, the visionary co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Salesforce, who also, of course, happens to be the ringmaster for the Dreamforce Conference. Take a look. Mark, why do 171,000 people congregate each year? Well, this year's the most ever for a conference. Jim, this is our family reunion. It's our customers, our partners, our employees. We're all getting together to welcome each other home. This is a very important day in Salesforce. It's when everybody's able to come together, share what they've learned, figure out what their path is going forward, and uh, celebrate. That's what Dreamforce is. Oh, and give back. We're giving and back give at back. scale. Now, uh, one thing that I've learned from this trip more than ever is, is that the people who can use your platform don't necessarily need to go to Stanford CompSci. That is 100% true. You know there's only 15 million pr programmers in the world. Right. And I think you just touched on Salesforce's secret sauce. We have this amazing platform, and every year we add something new in that platform to give our customers the power of the most current, best computer science technology. First, of course, it was the cloud, right. then it was social, then it was mobility, you know, then it was IoT, and this year we're adding artificial intelligence. So all of these incredible customers are gonna have all the powers of machine intelligence, right. machine learning, and deep learning right inside the Salesforce platform, but they don't have to be a data science to know it. Well, then let me ask you, this is the event, okay? And yet somehow it's gotten caught up with something that you could end, uh, which is this notion that you've kicked the tires, Twitter. You're trying to figure out whether to pay for it. And let's just end it and just talk about Einstein. Let's just forget about buying somebody else. Well, Jim, you know, the reality is is that Salesforce is a super innovative company. Right. Forbes has said we're one of the most innovative companies in the world now, six years in a row. They even said we're innovator of the decade. Right. Where does that innovation come from? Innovation comes both organically and inorganically. So we look at a lot of deals. In fact, we look at almost every deal, okay. but we do almost no deals. Right. We actually do very, very- A $20 billion deal? Would you ever just say, you know what, we the, do our very shareholders few deals. don't want 20 billion. Our shareholders do not want me to go borrow a lot of money, even if I have partners that spend 20 billion. They don't want it, and I, I'm beholden. What my shareholders want, I'm confident of this, is they want me to look at every single company, pick out the best ones, and do the ones that are in their interest, and that's what we do. That's our strategy. And, you can see how well that served our company over time. And if I was to address any specific deal at any right. specific time, it sets a precedent that then all of a sudden, I have to acknowledge every deal I'm doing. And as you know, like just this year, we've done some amazing deals with Demandware and with Quip. And we've Crux. also done this amazing Crux. deal this week, Crux. And the reality is we're gonna continue to do amazing deals, but, I, but I, we do deals that are in the interest of our customers and our shareholders. But perhaps people don't understand what they need. As Steve Jobs said, and you knew Steve Jobs, I look at Twitter as this. Bobby Kennedy once said, there are those that look at things the way they are and ask why, meaning how come Twitter's so bad? And then there are people who say, I dream of things that never were and ask why not, how I can fix Twitter. Come on, if we look at Twitter right now, it is so bad. But if we look at it the way Bobby Kennedy would look like, maybe well, you, you know, because you used it every day. It's a great product. It's, yeah. it's an exciting product. Um, but obviously the business has a lot of challenges, very severe challenges. It could take the and stock down huge. I mean, the guys would just dump your stock because it's going to have a disaster quarter. Maybe after the quarter, it comes down to 18, 19, different price. <laughs> Maybe it's interesting. Maybe it's a price issue. Maybe it's like retail. Maybe you should Japan. come in and run our M&A strategy, I, I'm, Jim. I'm, I don't well, know. But geez, I'll, I, let me I like look. Network, but here's but the deal. The reality is, look, all I can do is one thing, right. which is wish my good friend Jack Dorsey well. 
that's the most. He's the CEO of that company. Right. He, it's his job to make that a great company. It's my job to make Salesforce a great well, company. Can we wish Satya well? Because I don't know this LinkedIn. It seems like a tussle. <laughs> you, Satya, and I mean, he's a he's a guy you told me I ought to get right, to right. know, and now yep. you're like trying to get him to like. I don't know. He LinkedIn. You're not crazy about what he's doing. I mean, come on. Let's, let's change that right now. Say, right. listen, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, Satya, number one, is a good friend of mine. Right. And number two, um, you know, in our industry, we have a, 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 an old phrase, which is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Okay. But I guess in this case, the enemy of my enemy is my frenemy. All right, fair <laughs> enough. Now, and the, rea the reality is that You're cool with since Microsoft has kind of announced LinkedIn, I'm cool right. with Satya, okay. for sure. But some of his executives, however, I'm not cool with because they've made some very aggressive statements about what they're going to be doing with this LinkedIn data, Jim. I mean, it's amazing what they've said. And they're doing things that are absolutely anti-competitive. And that's what I wrote on Twitter. You right. read that. Yes, we did an op-ed on that. We brought that to the attention of the regulators. Because look, if they're going to buy LinkedIn, LinkedIn's a great company. We right. looked at LinkedIn, too. We, we right. would have loved to have LinkedIn. It had incredible deferred. Price. Yeah, well, it had great deferred revenue. Right. So right. it made it that's very right. exciting. But you know, the reality is, when you buy a company, and if you are the largest and most important software company in the world, which Microsoft is, right. or as our attorney David Boyes says, he says Microsoft is different than other companies because of their size and scale, shape, and position of power and monopolistic characteristics that you have to look at if they're going to buy a company, what are they going to do with the data? And data is the new currency, Jim. Right. And so they need to be held accountable. And some of the things they said they're going to do with that data I felt I, might have been a little bit right, on the wrong side out. of the Let's fence. All right, well, that's fair enough. And you stated that on Twitter, and you say it here. Uh, if it weren't for the Twitter discussion, we would have been sitting here talking about Einstein, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and whether the machines are so much smarter than we are that we can't intuit the way they can. I think the most important thing with artificial intelligence is what we said first, which is that all these amazing customers, which represent hundreds of thousands of companies all over the world who use Salesforce, need artificial intelligence to make their salespeople better, service people better, marketing people better, to help them build more intelligence around their products. But they can't get there because of a block, and that is the people don't exist. But well, now they, they can because the Salesforce but platform But they exist at Amazon. Has that. I mean, people, your customers need to, well, you're a friend of me there. People need to be able to compete with Amazon. Are you enabling them to be able to do that? Absolutely. Our, right. our customers can compete with Amazon. They can also have incredible experiences by building intelligence into their applications. They're going to be able to know, what's this great territory that I'm not in that I should be in? Or why is this salesperson not selling more? Or the salesperson may be guided and say, hey, you're not going to close that deal unless you email the CFO today. And that's going to make for more productivity, higher revenue, higher market share for our customers. Because we are only successful if our customers are successful. That is what is so exciting about how Salesforce is architected. Uh, right over here, I went to the Quip Cafe. Had to wait in line. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't have me schedule oh, Apple. Okay. What, what is Quip? Well, Quip is really the next generation in productivity. I mean, we've all grown up on spreadsheets and right. word processors, and we all know what that is. But when was the last time that you got a spreadsheet or word processor and email? I mean, that's a productivity drain. Right. Because as that travels around the company, you lose all the institutional memory. And customers are kind of looking at, okay, well, hey, I got Microsoft Office 365 and I've got Google Apps, but I still have a lot of pain around my document management, especially right. around word processors and spreadsheets. Can you help me? And we have deeply integrated Quip into the Salesforce platform okay. again with our authentication, empowering our customers. And it is super exciting. I mean, I've never been, honestly, I mean, I'm really excited about Demandware. I've been excited about a lot of our acquisitions. I have never been so excited about an acquisition such as Quip, and I'm going to tell you why. I just was on a three-week tour around the country. I hit the eight major cities in the United States. I met with hundreds of customers. I looked them one-on-one, -on -one and they reviewed our whole product catalog. And for some reason, when we demonstrated Quip to them, they jumped out of their seats. They just go right to the App Store, okay. right to the Google Play Store. They can download Quip. They got going in the meeting, in the meeting. And they saw the difference, and they start to get their companies on Quip. It's incredible what's happening with All right, Quip. La last question. 
uh, it always seems like there's something else other than, than, than Salesforce going on. Last time I saw you, we were talking about how, that, other than demandware, that Microsoft was going to buy you. And, now, and that was all anyone wanted to talk about. Uh, what happened? Why is the narrative just not artificial intelligence, mobile, social, cloud, and making customers do be able to connect with you? Well, I, I mean, I have two major narratives, and one is, this is the age of the customer. I mean, you can see the world has changed right. dramatically. Social, mobile, cloud, that was in your book. Yes. IoT wasn't right. in your book, but next oh, well, book, yeah. Yeah, next sure. book. Next book. And now AI, next book, right? Right. AI will be in the next book. I don't think it's in the current book. No, it's not, no. but it will Okay, be. so the next book, these will be the five characteristics. And what does that do for customers? More revenue, more competitiveness, more market share, more efficiency, more productivity. That's what everybody needs today. And then the second thing we do here, Jim, is the age of equality. Right. We believe strongly in philanthropy, making the world better, fighting for people's rights. You know, you know that we have a lot of LGBTQ employees. Right. They want to make sure we're looking out for them. We have a lot of women employees, more than ever, and more women customers than ever. And we want to make sure that we have pay equity, which means women are paid the same as men. We even have a brand new chief equality officer reviewing all of our equality programs. And the last thing that we do is everyone has to adopt a public school. Absolutely. So That's important right. in today's Let's world. Let's leave it at that, because these are the things I know you care about, besides Thank you, just Jim. doing great for your customers. Yeah. It's Mark Well, Benioff. we want to build a great company that's yes, doing do. great things. Great, great, absolutely. Mark Benioff, Chairman and CEO of Salesforce. Welcome to it Dreamforce. It is an honor Thank to Thank you, here. Jim. Thank great you, to sir. have you back. Thank you. Booyah! Jim Cramer here from Mad Money. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube. Click here to subscribe and get the jump on my exclusives with CEOs, plus market news, investing advice, and a whole lot more.